let's go ahead and get started. Um, for everybody on the line, thank you. My name is Sarah Polano. I am a Senior Account Manager with Getting Hired and will also be your moderator for today's session, Making the Case for Disability Inclusion, presented by our community partner, Disability In. Before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. Today's session is scheduled for one hour from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, though I don't anticipate it's going to take the full hour. We will have plenty of time for questions. We are recording the session and we will send a link to that recording instead of sending out the presentation deck. And please feel free to ask any questions or provide comments through the chat box at any time. There should be a drop down option for that chat box at the top of your screen and those questions will come directly to me. We'll follow up with you after the webinar if we aren't able to answer your questions at the end of the presentation, but again, I think we'll have plenty of time. A reminder as well that everyone's line is automatically placed on mute, so please feel free to ask any questions through that chat box. The live captioning is being provided. I'll send the link through the chat box for you to access that if you need it. So without further ado, Becky, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah, so much. I'm really excited for this webinar, and thank you all for joining. I'm going to quickly go over the agenda and what brings me here today, and then we will get going. So my name is Becky Kern. I'm the Director of the Disability Equality Index at Disability In. I'll be talking a little bit more about Disability In in the next slide, but I want to start off by sharing a little bit about my story. So I'm a little person. I stand four feet tall. There are only 30,000 little people in the United States. So most, most people, when they see a little person, uh, they're seeing me for the first time as the only little person they see. And that translates to the challenges I faced when I was starting off early in my career. When I was applying to jobs, I was qualified for interviews. I had gone to college. I had a resume of internship experiences. But the moment I went in the door at an interview, I was judged based on my appearance. People didn't have to say it, but I could tell based on body language. I ended up sending out about a thousand resumes and went on a hundred interviews, sometimes up to four interviews a day. And one thing I regret about that whole experience, I know a hundred interviews is a lot, but I regret not getting the constructive feedback that could have led to me learning how to get better at interviewing. I think it's something common among people with disabilities, not getting that constructive feedback and we crave it because we want to get better and learn how to move up within organizations, not just enter an organization and be at an entry level job for a very long time. That may be someone's desired career path, but other people do wish to be in higher positions along their career journey if they work hard. And I think it's important for me to dedicate my continuous journey to helping others not have to go through what I went through, really having employers pay attention to body language and how you react to people and their differences. And I'll continue to talk a little bit about how my experience has influenced some of these recommendations, but I'm really excited to have everyone here today and let's get started. So we're gonna first talk about the business case for disability inclusion. We partnered with the American Association for People with Disabilities and Accenture on finding a business case. A lot of corporations want to know what's the financial return and value on hiring people with disabilities, and we will get to that, and then we'll share some disability inclusion tips. I'll share information about the DEI and best practices and recommendations for improving your score, rather, whether you're starting off for the first time or whether you've taken it before and want to improve your score, or even if you've scored 100, there's always room for improvement. And then as Sarah mentioned, there will be time for questions. And we also encourage you to be interactive throughout this presentation. Feel free to stop me through the chat box at any time and we can address any questions that may come up. I will get started. So Disability In, I've been with Disability In for about a year now and I've 
fallen in love with the organization. I'm really excited about the work that we do and the work that we're continuing to do. We are a business's partner in disability inclusion. We have over 160 corporate partners, and we have 50 affiliates across the country who are hosting events on the ground and doing some amazing initiatives, and all of us together have created some great change, and we will continue to do so. We recently changed our name from USDLN to Disability In because we're really starting to explore what's going on outside the U.S., and we'll talk more about that as well. So what's the, people ask, what's the business case for disability inclusion? We found a business case. In partnership with Accenture and the American Association for People with Disabilities, Disability In supported research that shows there's a correlation between companies who participate and engage in disability inclusion efforts and their financial performance. They perform better financially by investing in hiring and retaining people with disabilities. What we learned, top scoring corporations of the Disability Equality Index, we used the research of over the past four years of the index, and we learned that 28% of these companies have higher revenue, two times higher net income, and 30% better performance on economic profit margins. This is huge information. And people ask, why does this matter? If just 1% of unemployed persons with disabilities join the U.S. labor force, the GDP could get a boost of up to $25 billion. And something to remember, all of us are working together to change the unemployment rate of persons with disabilities, making sure that more people are getting hired. And in order for us to do that, we have to band together. And what I love about the work that we do is companies who are direct competitors are working together to solve these challenges because we need to have more people in the workforce, no matter which company they may choose to work for, we need to support their journey. And another thing to think about is that one company may only have a total of 195,000 employees, and just with that one company, the goal isn't to have every person hired with a disability, the goal is to level the playing field. We really want to make sure that people with disabilities are integrated into all corporations and all organizations and spread throughout. And improvement counts. So companies that improve their DEI scores are four times more likely to have a total shareholder return that outperform their peers when compared to non-improvers. And as we as I mentioned earlier, we will talk later on about ways to improve your score or work on things to look out for as you continue to engage with the DEI. And at the bottom of the slide, there's a link to the top scoring companies for 2018. We had 145 companies participate, and this is the list of those who scored 80 and above. Here are some disability inclusion tips. Start out your efforts internally. Try to see if there's someone in your executive leadership who is willing to identify as an ally or person with a disability. Gather cross-functional teams. What's great about the DEI is it allows you to discuss with people in other areas of the company to try to find the answers to some of the questions. And maybe you'll find people along the way in different departments who have a passion for disability inclusion or may have a child with a disability or may identify as themselves having a disability or friend. Try to find those people who are champions without the organization, within the organization, and then that leads to forming a disability-specific ERG with those cross-functional members who have a passion for this. Self-ID campaign. And Becky, I just wanted to uh, interject really quickly. Everyone's line should be on mute, um, but it seems that a couple are not on mute. If you could just double check and ensure you are, that would be great. Thank you. Self-ID campaigns. If you have that vis visible executive leadership support, try to create a self-ID campaign, get those executives to talk about it, and then maybe people at lower levels will feel more comfortable identifying 
create a viral campaign, get people excited about sharing what their disability is or their connection or just having a passion even if there's not a connection. Conduct training sessions. Anyone within your organization could benefit and be educated on disability inclusion and I think people will begin to learn that there's a lot more than that we all have in common in the workplace than differences. Make it known, make it available, uh, those, that information about accommodation policies and practices and things for applicants to learn from as they're joining your company, such as if they're going to apply to a job on your site, make it known that they can request an accommodation if they need it. If, if your talent and recruiters are trying to set up an interview, make it a procedure for them to ask if someone needs an accommodation. The more you ask if someone needs an accommodation, the more comfortable they feel to tell you what they may need when they come for the interview. Ensure inclusive supplier contracting. Check to see if you're engaging with disability-owned businesses. Disability Inn has a certification program for disability-owned businesses. It's a two-year certification, and it's important to continue to support those disability-owned businesses, which are now included in the billion-dollar roundtable spending, which is definitely a big deal. Start off by doing something small. Try to do some lunch and learns. Host some events where people can just learn about one person's story. Maybe you get that executive leader to self-identify and then maybe they'd be willing to speak at a lunch that could be organized by the ERG. There are ways that even throughout these different tips, you could group a bunch of them together. And then Disability Employment Awareness Month, we just finished a great successful Disability Employment Awareness Month in October, and it's a way to start where you host an event, get people together, educate them about either your ERG or bring in a speaker who happens to have a disability, and get people talking about stories. And it could be any type of an event. It could be an informational fair. It could be a panel discussion. It could be a comedy show. Try to make fun with it. and at the same time, people can learn about the importance of disability inclusion. And then maybe you can get to the point where you host events outside of Disability Employment Awareness Month because it's an awareness we need throughout the year. Disability Inn created these posters for our corporate partners and for everyone to use for National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And we encourage you to download them because they could be a way to start conversation within your organization. Now talking about externally. If you are really looking to learn more about the process of hiring people with disabilities and you aren't quite sure where to start, it may be a good idea to hire a specialist. Hire someone who's had experience in this area and can start those recruiting efforts. You can create the contract to outside expertise, disability, and other organizations. We have training that we could come in and give to your organization in order for you to learn more about setting up this program or creating a position for a strategist, just so you're talking about it. Hire and foster relationships with open-minded and diverse talent advisors. Come to conferences. The Disability in Conference takes place every July. There are many other diversity conferences that take place throughout the year. If you get to know these people, they can start guiding your recommendations. Conduct outreach. Look at the advocacy organizations. You can also do some recruitment online. I know Getting Hired and other organizations have online career fairs. There are ways to find talent. I think a lot of people hesitate because they're ready to hire and willing to hire, but they're just not sure where the talent is. And we even have a next-gen mentoring program where students in STEM finance or business are trained and ready to be hired and continue to seek out those initiatives. And ensure flexibility in recruiting. If a job 
description says you need to be really active and carry heavy boxes, make sure that that's really what's required of the job because that may be pushing someone with a disability out of the position even though maybe that job could be altered a little bit. Really be honest with yourselves on how you create job descriptions and then they can be honest with you in return as to whether or not they feel they can do everything that's in the job description. In universal design, it's important to make your workplace accessible for everyone. What I love to talk about is the example where there's someone who's plowing a building, there's a ramp and a set of stairs. There's a wheelchair user who comes up to the set of stairs and asks the person who's plowing, can you please plow the ramp? And he responds by saying, after I finish the stairs. But if he had plowed the stairs or the ramp first, then we would have all been able to benefit by using that ramp and having the stairs be plowed afterwards. Cross-functional tools. As I was mentioning earlier, you can create cross-functional teams. And now here are some recommendations on tools that the organization can use throughout outside of DNI and HR. Other departments can use these tools as well. Try to track hiring goals. I know each federal contractor has a 7% hiring goal. Even if you're not a federal contractor, try to start one. Start small. Don't feel like you have to reach that goal right away, but start somewhere and make sure that you're thinking about disability and hiring and also accessibility and hiring. The Job Accommodation Network has this great toolkit that has information on educating your entire organization. There are different tools on accommodations, anything that may come up, and they're even open to adding more information if there are things that continue to come up as you are navigating this space. The Disability Equality Index, we highly recommend signing up, downloading the questions, at least getting familiar with the tool. We're transparent. The website has all of the questions you can download and even either a Word, accessible PDF, or Excel document. Get your organization talking about these things that are within the survey, which we'll talk about shortly, and that will definitely lead to some change. And create some training and resources to improve disability awareness. You can create some tip sheets. Start small and then continue to educate your organization throughout the year. Hey, Becky, we have a question, and I thought this would be a great time just to chime in. We've covered a lot of great content in terms of strategies, what you can do both internally and externally to create that inclusive environment for this population. Um, but somebody had asked, are there certain organizations that you know of that are focusing their efforts on the next-gen population? And for anybody who's not familiar with that term, that really just means uh, next generation is what it's short for. So college students, recent graduates, um, that population. And I know Disability In does have a program, and I know Getting Hired also supports that effort as well with a number of our university partners. But did they know if you had any other thoughts on um, specific organizations supporting students and recent grads? Absolutely. I, I know a lot of our corporate partners work with local schools as well, even if they're not necessarily a nonprofit. I know some great examples where people are getting in at the high school level, which is really important, especially when it comes to accessibility, because we need people to have access to the tools that will help them learn about technology. And if the technology is not accessible, they need to be able to access it in a certain way. And I think we need to continue to get to those younger generations to make sure they have access to the tools in order to succeed. But I would say Disability In has our next gen mentoring program. And then AAPD has different internship opportunities that happen throughout the summer. I know there are several other organizations who, whether or not they have a formal program, they are able to reach talent, uh, next-gen talent, or people who can get started with the training. I think mentoring is the biggest thing, no matter whether it's a formal program or not. Try to, even everyone on this call, try to find someone you can mentor and help guide them and give them that constructive feedback 
that will help them succeed in the end. And I think that just something to be mindful of, especially this next generation, we need to be mindful that they want to move up within the organization. So also that constructive feedback is huge. So even though it's not a ton of recommendations of uh, organizations, I would say check out what does exist within disability and in AAPD and getting hired and then branch out from there. But you can even start small and find one person to mentor and continue to make it grow. Now that's great information. Thank you for recapping that. Um, I think that's just a great question with so many different populations when you think about students, recent graduates, uh, more tenured professionals, and we are often looking for all of that. Um, so to have some additional resources for students specifically is great. Awesome. So now we'll talk about the DEI, and this ties in very well to that next-gen connection because the DEI is really meant to set up the infrastructure within organizations to be more inclusive with the, their hiring practices aim to get a high score at eventually. Uh, it doesn't have to be right off the bat, but continue to improve your practices. So then this next gen talent will see your, your organization as a best place to work for disability inclusion and they'll continue to engage from the consumer end and also potential employee. As I mentioned, those companies who score 80 and above are labeled the best places to work for disability inclusion. Anyone who scores below 80 is not published. So nobody knows that you took the DEI if you score below 80. And that information is confidential. And even those companies who score above 80, the information we share is the score of the company what and the name of the company and then we offer to promote them on social media with their score and a best practice that they're willing to share. <clears throat> the DEI came about in 2013 when the business community came together with the advocacy community and they had mentioned that there is this tool for LGBT inclusion that the Human Rights Campaign has produced, the Corporate Equality Index. How can we measure disability inclusion in the workplace? So that then formed the Disability Equality Index Advisory Committee, which is comprised of 50% business and 50% advocacy, and they work diligently to come up with these questions. Uh, it seems overwhelming at first since it's about 50 pages of questions, but they thoroughly thought about every area across an enterprise and any barrier that may come about as people with disabilities are trying to get into the workforce. In 2018, I mentioned how we had 145 participating companies, and there were about 25 different industries that were represented, and this just shows the top industries of 2018. Now we're going to talk about the DEI categories. So culture and leadership is the first category, and culture and leadership are subcategories within that. In culture, there are questions that really ask about, does your diversity and inclusion statement include the word disability? Do you have a disability employee research source group? Do you have a hiring goal for people with disabilities? Leadership, it talks a lot about, do you have someone in a leadership position who reports within two, le within two layers to the CEO who identifies as being an ally or supporter of people with disabilities? Do they have performance metrics that include diversity and disability inclusion? Enterprise-wide access, it talks about web accessibility, not just external facing, but internal facing. A lot of companies are focused on external facing accessibility to attract all of your customers, but there's another thing to think about if there was someone who was blind or had low vision and they wanted to work at your company, it would be important for them to access those internal portals and those payroll and timesheets. Employment practices, benefits, it asks about do you have a supplemental hearing aid benefit with full or partial coverage. 
Do you have mental health benefits above what's required by law? Do you have maybe an on-site counselor or workshops where you host so people can share what's going on and really help improve their health overall? Recruitment. Do you have, do you make it known that people can request an accommodation for either the job site or an interview? Do you have personality profile screening tests? This is a newly weighted question that's very important because that becomes a barrier for some people with disabilities as they're applying to the job. Some people who fail those tests end up having to wait a whole year before applying again. So we request that there's either an option for someone to opt out or you don't have it at all, so then there are no barriers. Employment education retention and advancement ask questions like, do you have any employees who use supported employment? Do you make it known that people with disabilities can retain, be retained and advance within your organization? I think that continues to be a barrier. A lot of people are celebrating hiring more people with disabilities and those numbers have definitely increased but we want to make sure that people know they have the opportunity to move up within the organization if they work hard. Accommodations. Do you have a policy in place? Do people know where to go to if they need to ask for Braille or captioning or an ASL interpreter? Anything that may come up within your organization as far as accommodations go, it's important for people to at least know who they can ask. Community engagement. Are you supporting disability organizations or philanthropic events? Do you have a social media policy where you caption videos that are on your Facebook page or you describe videos or you're describing photos that are posted? These things can all be helpful to the disability community as they engage with your organization. Supplier diversity. This is a new weighted question for or category for 2019. We introduced it in 2018. It's really asking if you're supporting disability-owned businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, making sure they're part of your spending agenda. Because a lot of people with disabilities, if they are continuing to face barriers to employment, they may find something they're passionate about and pursue it as their own business. And then we can offer that certification so you know that these are real, hardworking, disability-owned businesses who are ready to help you out. Non-U.S. operations, I mentioned earlier about disability and having a desire to see what's going on outside the U.S. This is going to be a non-weighted survey section, and we're just asking questions about, does your non-discrimination policy apply to employees outside the U.S.? Do you have ERGs or BRGs that are related to disability outside the U.S. and share some best practices. We want to know everything that's going on outside the U.S. as we continue to grow this tool. And Becky, I wanted to chime in before we dive into some of these best practices, but that's a lot of great information. Just summarizing again and breaking out all the different categories of the DEI, especially for those who have not taken it before. Um, so one is a tip. I just wanted to call out again, and I know we've discussed this and wanted to share part of that discussion that each of those categories and what you experience when you go through the DEI, uh, it's a great way for you to take a look at what you are communicating to current employees as well. So even, for example, your accommodation statement. Prior to the DEI, you may not have thought to dive into that in greater detail. You know, what is your accommodation statement? What is the process? What are some examples of what your company provides? When you find out that information, communicate that out to your current employees. Some of these steps really help to create that inclusive workplace, increase disclosure, help with retention. Same thing, Becky mentioned the ERGs and the BRGs. Everything that you're finding out about as the DEI takes you through every step, communicate that internally, but then externally as well if you're able to share that information. So I think that's a really great summary, Becky. Um, I wanted to just generally ask if 
do you find that there's any reason or general reason why companies may be hesitant to dive into the DEI? I know there are a lot of companies that already participate, um, but is there any reason why they may not, even just being overwhelmed, let's say? That's a great question. I really think people do get overwhelmed, but I think there's a lot of fear and stigma about not scoring well that first time out. And I think something to celebrate more is just getting started on the journey. One of the co-chairs of our DEI advisory committee often says it's more than a score. It gets you to really evaluate that, those policies and processes in place and question maybe why disability hasn't been included. A lot of the sections address just statements that already exist within your organization and just adding that word disability makes all the difference because then employees with disabilities know that there is opportunity for them within the organization from the hiring process to moving up. And I think it's important to get started no matter where you are on the journey. And this is a way to assess and figure out what you want the low hanging fruit to be that you can fix tomorrow and what can be a longer term plan, maybe three years down the line, holding yourself accountable. And we make the questions publicly available on the website because we want people to get started before they even engage with us because we want you to know that there are no secrets and we just want to help you on this journey. Absolutely. And I think that's a great thing to reiterate is that this is something that takes time. It's something that companies take very seriously um, and it's something that you may have to come back to. You may not be able to finish it all in one lunch afternoon or in one sitting. Um, so be prepared to really find out about your company as you take yourself through this survey and through these practices. Thank you. So here are some just best practices in general, what we've learned from the DEI. They really just encourage a culture of inclusion and this is just a way to get dialogue going within your organization. And then we have a whole best practices report on the DEI website, which is related to the 2018 survey. We released a DEI report in addition to a best practices report. So we highly recommend sharing those and also appreciate your feedback or any ideas you may have after this webinar. The number one thing to think about is just raising awareness of the ADA's definition of disability. I think people forget that 70% of disabilities are invisible. It could be cancer, it could be diabetes, it could be HIV, it could be a cognitive disability or a physical disability. Really make people aware. I think this is a perfect time to re-educate people on the Americans with Disabilities Act as we just uh, lost the creator of it and I think we need to celebrate that it's okay to have a disability and there's a strength in that because there's a different perspective that's brought to this world by having a disability and everyone just wants a chance. And I think if you start to educate people within your organization about the ADA's definition, more people would maybe be willing to self-ID or just be willing to talk about it. Think about creating a disability roundtable. Find some champions within your organization who are willing to talk about disability and work on some strategies that you want to put in place. Use the DEI as a template to figure out what are those low-hanging fruit that you want to work on and what are some longer-term goals. Create a memorable self-ID campaign. This is huge. If you find a catchy slogan, get your CEO or someone high up to talk about it it'll get people talking and hopefully more people will be willing to identify. And then I think the whole goal of all of this is for people to understand there are more people with disabilities already in your workforce and that should motivate you to continue to hire people with disabilities because they can bring such an asset to your organization. Make employees aware of the resources available. It's important to be transparent making sure people know who to go to if they have certain requests. I think a lot of times what's 
a great thing about having a conversation around the DEI is after companies take it, we've done some presentations where we talk about those areas where they weren't able to answer affirmative yeses. And if they bring in the right people to that meeting, they're able to turn some no's into yeses pretty fast. It's just making sure you're talking to the right people and knowing who to go to to ask some of these questions. And make it a priority to utilize disability-owned businesses. Corporate members of Disability Inn have access to a hub with our certified businesses, and we can also educate people on the programs that exist out there, conferences you can attend, engage with these businesses, and make it a priority for them to be suppliers. Here are some findings that promote inclusivity. Enterprise-wide access, we mentioned this earlier, all about web accessibility, internal and external facing. Only 55% of businesses have a company-wide external and internal commitment to digital accessibility. And this is of the companies who took the DEI in 2018. And what we see as an opportunity here is you can evaluate what areas of your business are accessible and inaccessible to people with disabilities and create a, try to find a way to develop a policy. Utilize those people who have physical disabilities or visual or hearing disabilities and making sure they voice maybe the challenges they're facing and then come up with a plan. Community engagement. 71% of the companies have a smartphone app, very common these days, having a smartphone app, especially if you're an outward facing, public facing company. But only 34% of them check it for accessibility. Make sure you audit for accessibility, especially those companies or who are just newly coming out with an app. Make sure it's done ahead of time so then you don't have to go back. It's really important to be accessible so all people can access your products and services. Now I'm going to just talk about a few recommendations for improving your DEI score. For first-time participants, I recommend you download the questions from the DEI website ahead of the benchmark open date and get as many departments as possible engaged. So currently we are in the registration period for 2019 and registration is taking place through January 31st. And the survey itself actually opens on January 23rd. So those companies who are already registered will receive access to the survey. You'll receive a link and be able to start and you'll have until April 12th to fill out the questions. But now, since all of the questions are available on the website, you can get started and start answering the questions manually on your spreadsheet. And then you can get to the point where you just have to enter it in on the survey. The more questions you can answer that are not do not know, the better, because then you know whether you have a policy in place or not. If you have firm yes or no answers, it'll help you in the long run to figure out how to change that no to yes or yes, um, continue to be yes. For current participants, whether or not you scored well, uh, take a look at the questions that you answered no but plan to within the next year and hold yourself accountable to make it possible to answer with an affirmative yes during next year. Either an affirmative yes or some parts of the survey questions ask copying a link or providing a paragraph that says a certain thing. Whatever the question may ask for, try to figure out how you can improve those answers. And then those companies who scored 100. We continue to have companies participate year after year because they know 100 isn't perfection. There's no one right way to practice disability inclusion, and we understand that. And these are just the inclusion practices that we recommend that are the most common, and we continue to learn from companies and advocacy as we continue to strengthen this tool. And we always appreciate any feedback people may have that we can bring back to the committee. Now we'll just talk about some key takeaways and open it up for questions and answers. 
We highly recommend sharing the business case research. We think this is groundbreaking research that will really change how people look at disability inclusion in the workforce. There's no longer that excuse that it doesn't help with the financial return. Download the DEI questions. Get yourself familiar with the DEI. Registration's open through January 31st. We hope you consider engaging with us. Take a look at your internal and external disability policies and diversity statements, making sure you're including that word disability because it means all the world to the community. Seek out an internal or external disability expert. Get started and just learn as much as you can. And host a disability inclusion event, whether it's during National Disability Employment Awareness Month or even July for the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act or May 17th is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. There are so many different opportunities throughout the year. Even create your own opportunity and pick a random date and really educate everyone internally and externally about the importance of disability inclusion and how we want to get to a level playing field where everyone has opportunity. Now we'll open up for questions. Here's my email address and a link to register for the DEI and also the DEI website has all the information from start to finish. Great, thank you so much, Becky. I really appreciate all this information. Um, a couple questions for you. So to summarize the DEI, again, if this is a company's first time diving into this, or even if it's not, maybe it's their second time and they're still new in their experience with going through the DEI, in order to prepare, are there certain departments or teams that you would suggest they have ready to pull in to help them answer some of these questions? Just looking at all of the different categories when it comes to supplier diversity, looking at what you have accommodation-wise, uh, you know, maybe looping in your HR department. Are there other departments that you would suggest grouping together and summarizing that? Absolutely. I think where I've found the most information that people don't have when they take the survey and then they bring in a group of people to listen to a presentation is those people who are building facilities and accommodations, uh, really trying to talk to them and figure out what policies are in place, especially with the question about uh, centralized accommodations funds. A lot of companies may have one but then people managers may not know about it, so it still affects whether or not they decide to hire someone based on the assumption that the accommodation is gonna cost a lot of money. But if they know they may have access to the centralized accommodations fund, then that may influence their decision in a positive way. And it's also important to understand that most accommodations are less than $500. So there's this huge stigma and assumption that accommodations cost so much, but really people want to have as few accommodations as possible, but they need some in order to be set up for success. Sure. And then I would say a lot, a lot of companies end up bringing in their uh, legal department just for a final review, just to make sure um, everything looks good and is signed off on. Uh, definitely HR, diversity and inclusion, supplier diversity, procurement, a lot of times those company, those departments don't sit together and it's important and it would be great to create more dialogue to unite those departments. Um, and then <laughs> marketing and communications, that would be really helpful for community engagement as you talk about social media plans and even marketing and communications for updating the website and diversity statements. I think they could be helpful in that way. That's great, thank you. And just talking about some of those categories when we talk about accessibility and a lot of this translates to barriers for candidates with disabilities that you're trying to hire and you're putting so much effort into. And then also current employees that you may have within the workplace as well. So a two-part question, the first being, do you have suggestions for a couple resources that companies can use to evaluate their website accessibility or app accessibility? Absolutely, so the job accommodation network that I had mentioned earlier for that cross-functional tool, 
they do a free audit of the career page of your website, and then they can recommend uh, organizations to work with when it comes to ensuring accessibility. So I would definitely reach out to them, and they've also released a report on building accessibility and accommodations. We work very closely with them, and they have some great insight that people can learn from in all of those areas. And I think the other thing is that whole retention and advancement piece, making sure these managers are learning to advocate on behalf of their employees if they feel that they're ready to move up within the organization. I think there's a lot of fear and stigma between the manager level and who they report to and may be afraid that they're going to be judged if they advocate and want to promote someone who may have a disability in their department. I think it's important to make everyone confident and ensure that success is, is possible. And I have to second what you say, what you said, Becky, and that JAN or Job Accommodation Network is a great resource. They've been a partner of ours for a number of years and are invaluable. Um, just a tip to everybody as well, of course, we're happy to answer any questions that you have, but if you needed to or if you wanted to, they also have a confidential phone number um, or hotline that you can call into and ask a question that you have about accessibility or accommodations if you aren't already talking to us and having that conversation with us. So again, just mentioning some of those resources or adding on to what Becky said. And then the second part of that question, Becky, is in terms of barriers for job seekers with disabilities. And we personally feel, and just looking at some of the research out there as well and hearing stories um, from job seekers with disabilities themselves, we feel that the biggest barrier is actually unconscious biases and stigmas. So web accessibility, um, app accessibility, absolutely that adds to it. But those stigmas, um, assumptions about somebody's abilities before letting them explain that themselves, um, that's probably in our eyes, one of the biggest barriers to being hired or making it to the next step of the interview. And wanted to get your thoughts on that. If that's something that you or Disability Inn agrees with, or if there's anything else that you, you feel is a large barrier to being hired as somebody with a disability. I think just the whole assumption piece, it, it would be great to just get rid of the elephant in the room the moment you get in the room. And maybe just start a conversation, have a general dialogue before jumping into the interview questions. Because I think it gets to that point where people are really uncomfortable at first, but then once you get to know the person, you realize, oh, wait, <laughs> we have more in common than we thought. I went to a non-conscious bias workshop a few years ago, and there was a, a drill that they had us do where we had to look around the room and try to find someone we looked nothing like and then the challenge was actually trying to find three things we didn't have in common. A lot of times someone may say, do you have siblings, do you have siblings, and stop there. Maybe they'll say, do you have a sister? I have siblings, but I have a brother. So then you may find the difference within that. But the whole goal of it was for everyone to understand we have more common in common than we think. And I think if both parties are uncomfortable in the interview, it's, it's going to prevent that next step from happening. And I think it's important, even if you are really thinking about hiring internally and you're just interviewing candidates for that extra due diligence, be honest with the person and also give them some constructive feedback. I think something that we all lack is getting that proper training and feedback in order to improve and hone our skills and talent. And that ends up preventing people from moving forward. And I think, of course, there's a lot of fear of quote unquote liability, but there's liability for anyone. <laughs> anyone, sure. it's, it's disability is the one category that anyone could fall into at any point in their life. So of course there are probably employees that have been hired that didn't have a disability before being hired, but now do. And I think that's why it's important for more people to share their story. So then it becomes a norm within an organization and then there's less hesitation on the hiring front. 
And that's a great point. Um, thank you for reiterating that. And I wanted to thank you again, Becky, for even sharing more about your personal story at the beginning of the presentation um, and sharing all this great information about making the business case, your recent study with Accenture and AAPD, and then more in insight into becoming successful within the DEI if you're going down that journey. So. We do not have any other questions at this time. I wanted to thank everybody again for joining our webinar and a reminder that we will not be sending out the presentation deck, but we are recording this and we'll be able to send out a link afterwards and as soon as that's available. So Becky, thank you again for your presentation, all of the great information. If anybody has any other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Happy holidays. You too, thank you.